Hello and welcome from the Faculty of Education at Monash University in Melbourne. My name is Viv Ellis and I'm the Dean of the Faculty. First, I would like to acknowledge the lands on which I'm speaking to you today and recognise that sovereignty was never ceded. I would like to specifically acknowledge that the Wurundjeri and Boon Wurrung people, communities of the Kulin Nation, are the ongoing custodians of the lands on which Monash University now stands. And we pay our respects through our research, teaching and learning to the Wurundjeri and Boon Wurrung elders and their past, present and future communities. A very warm welcome to everyone who is live streaming this event on YouTube. The Monash Faculty of Education is the largest and of course the best Faculty of Education in Australia. We're very outward looking and keen to engage with our international partners. If you'd like to find out more about what we do, I invite you to take a look at our website and perhaps to join us for one of the events in our Global Critical Conversation series, discussions between key international and Monash researchers, policy makers and other stakeholders, facilitated by leading Australian journalist Virginia Trioli. They're free and you can sign up on the Global Critical Conversations page on our website. I hope you have an enjoyable and productive time. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our new edition of Monash's Critical Conversations. And this evening, we're discussing the science of reading. Of reading, well, indeed, in, indeed, whether there is a science of reading, and I can tell you that that's going to be uh, a controversial topic in and of itself. It's great to be with you here this evening. I'm Virginia Trioli from ABC Radio and TV, and I've been facilitating these global critical conversations. Uh, from Monash University's education department for, well, since last year during the pandemic year lockdown and uh, for this year as well. And this conversation, is there a science of reading, is going to be, I think, one of our most interesting and possibly most controversial. All views are welcome this evening, um, but keep it polite. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all here, some of our live streamers from right around the country. We've got Sydney and Parramatta, Langwarren, Geelong, Box Hill South, Shell Cove, Mordialic, and uh, here in Melbourne as well. So there's a, a current debate, there's always been a very live debate on the scientific evidence base that informs reading development and instruction that leads to the question tonight or today, wherever you might be streaming us from, is there a science of reading? And that's something that's already sparked discussion amongst participants that I know have logged on here today. So this critical conversation will focus on aspects of reading acquisition and broader issues related to reading and reading development across the life cycle of learning. And that's going to be a particular focus as well. We'll also consider research evidence and a range of current issues relevant to students' learning and teaching practice. So I encourage you to take part in discussions and posing questions in the YouTube comments and chat section that you have where you're streaming us on YouTube as well. You'll need to be logged into YouTube to be able to do this. But you can also get involved with our Slido polling. So you can uh, vote on questions there. Uh, that uh, interest you and you can vote them up and hopefully they're the ones that we're going to get to when we get to our panel discussion. So let me introduce our terrific panel to you today and I'll ask our, our panellists to turn on their uh, screens, their microphones and also their video so that you can see them. Associate Professor Janet Skull from Monash Education. Uh, as I introduce you, if you can give everyone a wave so they know who you are, that'd be great. There's Janet. <laughs> Associate Professor Graham Parr, Associate Dean International at Monash Education. Professor Joseph Lobianco, who's Emeritus Professor at the University of Melbourne. And Joe is uh, logging on there and there he is. Professor Jennifer R R Rousel, who's uh, from the University of Bristol. Jennifer, there she is. And Professor Shelley Stag Peterson from the University of Toronto. And as ever, we have Jenny Leonard, who is our visual storyteller. Give us a wave. There she is. <laughs> the hand that notices everything and lets nothing go. So we're going to look at research evidence that informs our understanding of reading and learning to read, uh, the definitions of reading and possibly even the definition of science when it comes to the science of reading. I know there are some participants who want to get into that as well. So um, before we get started, I just want to quickly spool through our panel, maybe just, you know, one or two points that each of you can make in succession that uh, I, I guess why you're here today, 
Uh, what connects you to this question about whether there is a science of reading or not and what that science might be? Uh, Janet, I'll start with you. Well, thanks, Virginia, and welcome, everyone. Um, I'd also just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where we're gathered this evening and pay my respects to um, elders past, present um, and emerging. So as a brief introduction, um, my background is in primary school teaching and I've taught in a range of diverse settings um, across Melbourne. I've been involved in um, early years literacy curriculum development and teacher professional learning. Um, as an early years teacher and educator, I appreciate the importance of strong foundational teaching in reading and ensuring children's um, success as um, young readers. Over a number of years in terms of my own research, I've been involved in the study of children's reading and writing and also children's oral language, uh, learning that supports literacy. So really this notion of reciprocity between early reading and writing, the links to oral language, and continuity between children's literacy learning across um, early childhood settings and the early years of schooling uh, are central to my research. Alongside some work I've done that looks, has looked at um, early achievement and connectedness to school as ongoing indicators of success. Um, relevant to the conversation tonight is my work in teacher education with responsibility for course design of our initial teacher education programs at Monash in what is now really a highly regulated environment and it's becoming more prescriptive, particularly in terms of um, teaching reading and more specifically early reading. I think as I work with teachers of the future, I see it critically important that graduates from courses have a strong understanding of the research that guides and shapes their practice, but they're also able to engage in um, critique and debate um, respectfully um, about the teaching of reading now um, and in the future. So I guess, you know, the teaching of reading and understanding of reading research um, is central to my work and my interest in tonight's topic. Uh, thanks, Janet. Graham Parr, I'll, I'll move to you and I guess um, maybe you just uh, just a couple of points that you could make about about the topic that we're that we're discussing tonight and um, and where you sort of you know connect or, or, or don't connect to it. Thanks, Virginia. Um, yes, how do I connect? Well, much of my teaching and research. I'm going to jump in there. I don't want this to be a, a recitation of our CVs. We've all got <laughs> our CVs and what we've done and yep. everyone who's logged on tonight knows who you are. Yep. So let's get this discussion going. Yep. So what, why even join in on this question tonight? I, uh, well, I was just going to say that uh, my, my focus has been in secondary English education. Uh, and so that's thinking about the way that English um, is, is learnt and taught uh, to adolescents ages 12 and 18 in the social spaces of, uh, of secondary English classrooms. So um, I, I'm particularly interested in the way that uh, adolescents are, are learning to read and, and the way they're developing their reading cap capabilities. But like Janet, I'm very interested in the close interconnections between um, this work and their writing and writing capability and, and how that's developed. Uh, I, I suppose that means I'm really interested in language and it's continually evolving nature um, and the ways that, um, first of all, adolescents use reading and writing to make sense of language as much as they actually use language to make sense of writing and, and reading. So this involves adolescents engaging with, yes, alphabetic scripts, words on a page or on a screen, and, and whether this be in wonderful um, and, and emerging um, works of literature, but also in, in debates and, and, and texts written about the, the latest issues in news media, whether they Black Lives Matter or Me Too or climate change or indeed challenges to our democratic freedoms. So I'm interested in the way that adolescents read and write to make sense and make meaning in this world. Um, but, but that can't happen just with um, alphabetic script. So I'm interested in a whole range of other multimodal and continually emerging um, what sometimes referred to as semiotic resources. So that means making texts that run from left to right on a screen and top to bottom on a page, um, but also a whole range of digitally mediated texts and experiences that include sound, image, video on a, on a dizzying and sometimes uh, 
confronting range of uh, screens and, and devices. Mm. So uh, in the end, I guess I'm interested in the way that ad- ad- adolescents learn and develop as readers and writers and as identities. And I think that development of them as identities is as crucial as, the, as what we're seeing in terms of their developing as readers. Graham, thank you. Joseph Lobianco, I'll, I'll move to you about what interests you in this notion of a science of reading. Thank you very much. I'm particularly interested in the context of reading and literacy, um, and especially multicultural and uh, uh, multicultural contexts and multilingual ones. So bilingual literacy is a great interest of mine. Um, And in Australia, we have to be interested in and and concerned about questions of linguistic human rights, um, language revitalization, and what indigenous people call both ways education. Uh, These are the big contexts of uh, how reading gets operationalized in schooling and elsewhere. Um, And this is part of a wider uh, movement across the world for seeing the right to education as really the right to literacy uh, within the context of this emerging movement of linguistic human rights. Great. And we'll absolutely get to that. There'll be a fair bit of our discussion that we'll uh, concentrate on that today as well. Uh, Jennifer Rousel uh, from the University of Bristol. Welcome. Great to have you on board. Uh, What connects you to the conversation today? Well, thank you, Virginia. I would imagine, and it's it's an honour to be here, that I was invited because of my work in digital literacy. So... I trained many years ago to 2000 is when I graduated with Brian Street and Gunter Kress. And they were sort of uh, at the time trailblazers. And I think what I've seen come to fruition over the many years is how things like multimodality and the digital have become so much a fabric in, uh, in terms of our lives and what we do, especially now as we move beyond the pandemic. So I'm guessing that I'm here in order to speak to um, digital domains, digital spaces, and my passion right now um, is to reimagine what reading is. So to build on what we know about reading as word-based, but to truly think about a new language framework assessment for um, the ways in which we navigate digital texts. So maybe in that way, I, I have a quite discreet expertise here, but um, it's very much about 21st century notions yeah. of reading. Yeah, and a very contemporary one. Thanks for that, Jennifer. And Professor Shelley Stagg-Peterson, from the University of Toronto. Great to have you on board as well. I hope the timing is not too terrible for you <laughs> in terms of uh, whether we've got woken you up or kept you awake. Um, <laughs> can you give us just a couple of points uh, about what interests you in this notion of, of a science of reading? Well, I'm honored, I like Jennifer, I'm very honored to be part of this conversation. And I guess the whole term science I find exciting. Science to me is all about discovering and and learning new knowledge, deeper understanding. Um, But I I don't believe that there's any such thing as the science or a science. And so that immediately piques my interest. If someone says there is the science or a science, I'd like to ask questions. Um, I feel that in terms of learning how to read and just the whole process of reading, we don't have all the answers. And in fact, I don't think we've asked all the questions. As long as there are some students in our classrooms who are having difficulty with reading, then I think we need to keep asking questions. So I I find any conversation about a science or the science of reading very interesting. Uh, I, I believe that societies are always changing, that when we are conducting research to try to understand a really complex practice like reading, Um, we have to think about how technologies are going to have an influence. We have to think about how the ways that we interact and how technologies impact the ways that we interact will influence how we understand reading and and what we do when we read. So I'm excited about a conversation where we can talk about today's sciences or today's theories or models or ways to think about reading, um, but also ways to think about future sciences of reading as well. Before we move on, um, maybe a little explanation of what multimodality is and what it is in terms of the work that you do. Who'd like to jump in there? I know. I won't I'll accept, jump in. I won't accept science. Uh, silence. Go ahead, Jennifer. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a bit of a, a clunky word. Um, yeah. But but multimodality uh, really started off. Um, I mean, it's an it's an age old thing, right? I mean caves, ancient caves have cave drawings, right? So um, a mode is literally a unit of meaning, okay? So a word is a mode, um, a visual is a mode. um, 
And then there's sort of a breaking apart of different, different types of modes. So you can have colors that are, play a role in it. Uh, so multimodality was a way of explaining communication way back in 1996. So Jolo Bianco was part of the New London group. Um, and it was a way of defining literacy in relation to not one single mode, monomodal words, but multiple modes that get interwoven together uh, within text. So that can be visuals, um, words, um, and then when you think about digital text, um, moving images converged in with words and so on and so forth. So it's literally um, a, a, an interweaving of different modes that work in unison. Um, and sometimes one is more dominant than the other. Okay, thank you. Um, and there might be some more questions that, that arise uh, about this once we sort of get to our discussion period. And I'll, I'll just remind everyone to keep their eye on the discussion sections in YouTube, the chat there, and also to have a look at our Slido voting to uh, nominate some questions and vote them up if you'd like to see them asked. So look, let's kick off with, um, I think, what almost everyone has alluded to, which is the very passionate nature of this discussion, the sometimes controversial nature of it, the fact that it can become polarised and also that, that the concept of, of uh, the correct way of learning to read can be owned and sort of divided up between people. Why do people become so passionate about reading and the science of reading? I might start with you there, Janet. Oh, thanks, Virginia. Look, passion's really interesting. And I think every year, you know, a new group of children come into the school system and there's always going to be sort of excitement around learning to read and also some possible anxiety around um, learning to read as well. And, you know, we've probably all heard stories of children coming home from school after the first day and saying, you know, quite disappointed that they didn't learn to read. You know, there's an excitement about learning to read that generates a passion as well. I think passion also comes from, you know, there's a deep-seated desire, I think, to support young children and a genuine concern to address, you know, sometimes distress associated with children experiencing reading difficulties. Um, there will be and continues to be a range of different models and theories of reading from different disciplines that use different perspectives to view reading. And so it's clear that the lens that you bring to the phenomenon, you know, may influence how you um, research the subject and how it influences the science. So there's passion from a discipline-based um, perspective about reading. I think the passion about the science of reading, you know, particularly more interesting, more uh, recently is really interesting. And... Um, and it is often related to, you know, sometimes or often related to phonics. Um, so first, I think, um, you know, we talked about modalities um, and different modalities. We talk about the alphabetic principle as one of those modalities. And central to the alphabetic principle is um, phonics instruction, particularly in um, the early stages of learning to read. Um, inquiries into teaching literacy, you know, acknowledge clearly that learning to read involves the development of both decoding and comprehension and building of these complementary skills. As children learn how to decipher text, but also um, learn to understand what, um, what print means. You know, the science of reading's been around or the term's been around for quite a long time. Um, and recently this has received some very passionate and focused attention. Um, journals have dedicated whole editions to exploring the topic and editors have create, curated papers on the science of reading. And these papers do present a range of views from interpretations that might focus solely on um, word reading, the role of systematic phonics instruction, to those that consider reading as a more dimension, multi-dimensional sort of complex, complex process. Um, you know, passion around reading scientists, teachers and the public, but we know that reading involves more than alphabetic skills and um, learning to read is, is quite complex. Um, so I think there's a large body of literature that informs our practice and, and acknowledges a science of reading with the key elements identified and similarly and um, respectfully others, I think as Shelley also um, mentioned in her introduction, that it's perhaps not a settled science. 
Um, I think we need to continue to quarry the evidence and explore translational research better to understand the kinds of instruction that supports different students to learn. Personally, I'm passionate about um, studies of teaching that show progress in children's reading accuracy and comprehension as integrated um, as integrated into our teaching programs. So there's a lot of passion in different areas around the sure. let, me, let, me, let me jump in then and, and go to, to Graham on that. It, it, does that explain the fact that, as um, Janet just alluded to, the fact that she uh, believes and others argue too that it's not a settled science? Does that account for a degree of the passion that we see in the debate about it? Do you think? Uh, I think that's got something to do with it. Um, but I actually want to take on this issue of, of a science and what we understand by science or sciences. Because if we understand science as, let's say, a gold card that I can keep in my pocket that includes, a, I don't know, a list of indisputable facts showing how people across different cultures and contexts read. Um, and, and on a separate card, I have a, another prescribed list of ways in which reading should be taught, then, then um, I wouldn't be subscribing to this notion of reading, uh, science of reading, and, and I don't think um, any of us on this panel would either. Um, I, I actually think it's better to think of, of there being different sciences. Uh, it's of a different nature, for instance, than the science of climate or, or climate science. I think it's different from COVID science in some respects. Um, uh, in, in some respects, I think it might actually be more helpful to think about things like a science of democracy. <laughs> you know, it's not something you can come up with a prescription of this is what it is and this is what it looks like. It's a continually contested and, and changing and emerging um, construct, which is the focus for fantastic discussions. Um, so let me, let me try with a, a, a definition of a science of reading. I'd say it's a dynamic, ever-evolving, combination of conversations and controversies, principles and practices related to reading and reading practices. And these conversations play out in academia and public spaces. They're informed by evidence that's widely knowledge, acknowledged as authoritative, but um, confusingly or perhaps irritatingly, these authority, authoritative sources don't agree with each other, which makes for one of the, the excitement of it. But it, it becomes it mixes with this passion that uh, Janet, Janet was talking about, where people are genuinely concerned or disturbed if they hear of a young person who's um, somehow locked out of or uh, unable to ex uh, access that excitement of reading. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's something which, understandably, they're, they're very, very concerned about. Um, this is, uh, as you alluded to in your, in your opening introduction, though, yeah, this is something that has been going on for many, many years. Um, uh, it, it, with something as complex as reading, um, it's perfectly human to want there to be a simple and kind of um, um, fix-all solution that we can um, put on a, on a small gold card. Um, uh, but but the, the difficulty is that, that that's um, an illusion. It's a kind of a, a, a seductive illusion, but it's, it's a, an illusion. The difficulty, I think, in this post-Trump world is that we've seen this kind of... Um, um, taking a passion for something and, and a desire for simplicity to sort of uh, greater and greater extremes so that we sometimes see individuals or groups um, developing kind of unshakable beliefs. Um, passion um, as an intense conviction turns into something which can't be challenged um, in any form or shape or by any kind of evidence. Uh, and I think that maybe helps to explain um, a sort of a visceral, personal, human dimension of it, but also a desire to affirm one's point of view um, against others that might want to try and um, um, push it away or, or, or bash it down. Okay. I, I want to go to um, Shelley um, Stagg-Peterson, if I can. Does the, the nature, of, I think you, you've picked up perhaps there from, you know, Graham and Janet, the nature of the, the debate that, that can um, uh, really blow up sort of quite strongly here in Australia along those lines. Do you have something similar where you are? Uh, are, are those degrees of passion as evident there too? Yes. And in fact, the Ontario Human Rights Commission has been brought aboard this conversation I'm not sure who the plaintiff is, but there is a right to read inquiry that is being carried out in Ontario, the province of Ontario right now. And all faculties of education have been required to provide our syllabi for our literacy courses for beginning teachers. School boards have been required to provide all the materials, the lesson plans that are being used to teach literacy. And the inquiry is working with the assumption 
that schools and faculties of education are denying children the right to read because we are not using the science of reading. We are not using science, a scientific basis for our teaching of reading. So yes, indeed, um, the conversation is, wow. is very passionate in Ontario. And, and what would that science of reading be? The underlying assumption in the terms of reference for the inquiry is that uh, decoding has to come first, that uh, children have to be taught but uh, very systematically, the relationships between letters and sounds. And once that is in place, then they can go on to try out what, what I think the, um, would be considered the frills of reading. Uh, but you have to have first the letters and sounds in place. Um, something similar, uh, Jennifer uh, Rousel, for you as well. Uh, Je Jennifer well, I mean, as, I, as I've said, I, I think I'm on the... Um on the edges of this in that I don't think that reading is a science and I don't think it's helpful just to focus on books. Um, I think that literacy is a discipline and it's a field um, and reading is idiosyncratic. Readers have so many different kinds of needs um, that phonics is a piece of it, decoding is a piece of it. But I think if you look at global reports like OECD, it's very clear that what's, what's affecting reading internationally is, are things like um, not, you know, learning to read, right? You learn to decode, but once you move beyond that, it's developing critical awareness. It's being able to uh, move across print-based texts, move on to digital texts, follow navigation, curate the right information, critically analyze the right information, understand uh, the genres of texts, so there's tremendous complexity. And what I find about terms like the science of reading and phonics is it stops conversations and it becomes very much a group saying what reading is and should be. So again, I'm probably quite controversial in terms of the way I feel about it, but I feel it's idiosyncratic. I feel that reading is something that can be a cognitive need where you have to work on a particular skill, but it's also very much guided by linguistic diversity, by social cultural environments, by vernacular literacies. Um, and so the field really needs attention and, and language like science and phonics shuts that down. Why do you believe it shuts it down? Could that, uh, can that not sort of be one, one step along the path to exactly what you talk about then, which is, and, I, and you're, you're right about the OECD. I think they're absolutely bang on when they talk about that, you know, it's uh, talking about needing to, to educate uh, early learners and, and, and middle learners to a, a reading level of proficiency, uh, enabling them to distinguish facts from opinions and actually, you know, understand a more sort of, you know, subtle and nuanced I have that subtle and nuanced understanding of language, but but why do you believe it shuts it down? Does one not lead to the other? Well, I mean, I guess the caveat is also developmental, right? So when you're dealing with younger children, you're going to you're going to swoop in and you're going to really focus on phonics and comprehension and decoding, obviously. So there'll be a focus on words, but once once students start to gain momentum and start to um, read to learn. Okay, you and I hope you understand that. So learning to read, yeah. decoding, yeah. reading to learn, you get you you have a working knowledge, you start to develop your fluency. And then once you develop your fluency, you start to read across a variety of texts and you start to have to be able to uh, distinguish, differentiate and, and be critically aware about what's reliable content. What text do I need to access? So if you look at effective readers now, modern, modern, um, fluent readers. They're readers who are adept at being able to read across multiple genres, find the information that they need, and, and be able to move on. So focusing on words solely, um, and, and particularly focusing on sort of sound-based efferent kind of theories, I think holds us back from being, starting to reimagine what reading is. I suppose that's what I mean. Okay. Um, I want to move on to you if I can, Joe, because I, I know that... Um... As a, I think I understand that for you, science. I don't think you find the word science particularly even useful in this uh, in this conversation and in the framing of our discussion today. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yes, yeah, so I agree with Jennifer's depiction of it, and also some many of the things that were said before. And I don't disagree with anything that anyone said, but I, I just really feel that the it's there's a distracting universality assumed in 
claiming, uh, especially in the singular form, is there a science of reading? Um, you know, it's very important to keep in mind that um, most of the people who read in the world, or large numbers of the people in the, who read in the world, don't read alphabetic languages. Um, they don't even re they don't read alphabetic texts, or they read them mixed in with other. Uh, um, uh, 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 semiotic modes, as uh, as Graham uh, mentioned before. Um, so, if we're talking about a universal uh, depiction of what's involved in reading, we have to take in take into account questions of language and questions of social attitudes to language and how how reading happens. Now, it's very clear that in the early years of schooling questions of explicit instruction around language are important for many students, for immigrant students, for struggling students, for students whose home environments haven't predisposed them very well to the um, expectations of schooling. Um, but there are just so many contexts that are so diverse from each other um, and the modalities in which um, uh, language is packaged in text through different genres, through different, even, even in the print form in radically different ways, that I think it's just um, uh, um, overtaking too many differences that need to be accounted for. So, um, you know, I'm not opposed to people doing the kind of uh, research into uh, uh, micro processes of cognitive based word decoding. I've, I've, you know, there are many students who, who would benefit by the work that's done there, but that shouldn't be the dominating discussion about literacy. Literacy is a, an absolutely uh, foundationally important uh, expectation in education. There are high stakes, um, uh, uh, tests and processes and post-schooling uh, opportunities that are mediated by the levels of uh, the manipulation of written language and its other forms that, that students gain. And these are really displaced when uh, there's so much focus on really just one aspect that's about the earliest years. It's not to say it's not important. In fact, James Heckman won a Nobel Prize in economics, I think in the year 2000, and he called his expression for uh, literacy was a skill that begets other skills. So in this kind of bi biblical terminology, he's talking about literacy is something that actually opens and activates. The metaphor that's always used about reading is the door that's closed to students and the riches that are beyond this door and literacy is the key that opens this. Now, it's very clear there's a long history of thinking about uh, reading but re in, in this way, but reading in this way was always reserved for tiny numbers of people around very um, small parts of the process of uh, meaning making. And today, um, as has been said by previous speakers, uh, what and very much more in the future, we need a much more contemporary notion of literacy and maybe even of literacies, which um, uh, includes but goes beyond um, what, what is understood as language reading. Okay, well, with that, then why don't we talk about where the, where the common ground can be found, perhaps? Uh, between the, all the positions that we've been talking about uh, in this conversation. Shelley, I might go to you first of all, if I can. I believe that one way to find common ground is to show new ways to think about the research that is touted by the proponents of the science of reading as being the leading scientific systematic research. Um, so I, I would like to introduce, if, if, um, if others are not familiar with the simple view of reading, which seems to be the gold standard for those who are proponents of the science of reading. And so Philip Goff and, and William Tunmer say that this equation of reading comprehension equals decoding times linguistic comprehension explains all that you need to know about reading, what reading is and how you teach reading. And I would like, as someone who likes to think about literacy more in a broader terms, I would like to show how we can actually find common ground, even with the research that is being um, brought forward as the research that, that um, science of reading folks are saying supports a narrow view of teaching reading. 
So if we think so, that the goal is reading comprehension. And I would say that's the goal of those who think more broadly about literacy too, that understanding meaning making is a goal. Um, so we have common ground just to start. Then thinking about decoding, I think as all of uh, my colleagues here today have said, thinking about letter sound relationships, how you, how you um, decode words is an important part of literacy. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. Linguistic comprehension. Well, you have the word comprehension already in the word. So the semantic cueing system or the, or the meaning um, based sources of information for reading and all literacies is, is inherent in that expression, linguistic comprehension. Syntactic, when you think about linguistics, you think about the way words are organized to create ideas and sentences. Um, pragmatics, the way that texts are organized, information is organized to, to communicate uh, information or for particular purposes. So really, I don't think that we're so far apart. It's just a matter of, of the interpretation. If, if that simple view of reading could just be enlarged, to consider that it's actually not so simple, that, that reading is a very complex process. And even though that equation makes it seem like it is very simplistic, if you really break it down and look at it from another lens, you'll see that it is complex after all. Do you agree, Janet? Mm, I do. I, I think, first of all, we need to acknowledge the complexity um, of reading as a process. But I think in terms of common ground, we all understand that phon phonics is really part of that process um, as well. And my work in terms of, you know, very young readers, you know, we have to take account of um, how we teach phonics. And it's, you know, there's also, you know, some debate around this. But you know, things like um, the teaching of writing, you know, there's a lot of commonality here. When you watch young children write, you do see their intense, intense rather, um, attention to letter sound relationships, concepts about print, including letter details and how letters are formed, directionality, sequence of phonemes, sequence of letters, um, spaces between words, connections between oral language messages and print messages. So as part of a, a sort of a, a print-based or a, a holistic approach to how you might um, think about young children's um, literacy acquisition, you know, thinking broadly about, you know, the contributions of writing and how that plays out, or as I talked about before, you know, the reciprocity between oral language and reading and writing as building um, literacy for young children. You know, I think there's also some common ground um, around, you know, assessing students for teaching. Um, you know, all teaching is going to be dependent upon what children know and then how we analyse that reading data to plan for teaching accordingly. And, you know, some of these assessments may indicate that children do need more explicit phonics instruction. But similarly, that doesn't mean that's, you know, a one size fits all approach to our teaching. There others might need to consider other aspects of reading. You know, Shelley talked about, you know, comprehension, engaging with text to develop some of these executive functioning skills to build comprehension strategies. Similarly, it might be around vocabulary or language skills that yeah. um, young students need. So I think we need to think broadly and more conceptually around, um, you know, the multi-dimensional aspects, complexity of reading and mapping and matching our um, instructional practices to support young children. Let me just jump in there because I think you wanted to say something, Shelley. I wanted to add, um, Janet was talking about the children who are having difficulties with reading. Some of the research that has been done um, looking at adults who've been diagnosed with dyslexia, how, how they're reading as adults, I think could be interpreted. So the science of reading folks are interpreting it as, oh, we, we didn't serve these, these individuals well in school because they're still having difficulty with decoding because that's the results of these studies that adults with who've been diagnosed with dyslexia are, are able to read, they are understanding what they read, but they still have difficulty with decoding. And I think if we turned that around and looked at the research findings in a different way, we could say, well, but they are understanding. And some of the research like Leslie um, Fink's research show that 
the, the adults who are um, who have been diagnosed with dyslexia, who are reading fluently with understanding, literacy is part of their professional lives, say that decoding, yes, is difficult for them. So they learn to use the other sources of information and that's what has made them successful readers. So I think another part of common ground is taking a look at the research um, that has been um, examining individuals who have difficulty with reading and how look at how they have become successful readers and interpret their the results of that research in a different way yeah um i just i'm going to go to um to joe in just a second to talk about the um science of literacy and the connection to indigenous communities he alluded to that earlier and i'd like to get to that but before we do anything you'd like to jump in there with jennifer because i i in particular when we're talking there about adults and i'll i'll get you just just to leave yourself off, off mute i mean you can leave your microphone on the whole time because then you're then you're able to jump in more easily um well, I suppose I would say you're dealing with with a long history, Virginia. I mean, these are uh, these these are the reading wars, right? I mean, this is there was a classic um, article written by iconic reading researchers, Catherine Snow, James Paul G. And in that article, I think in the Harvard Ed Review, they really um, fought it out about which which model works, right? And it really was very much to put it in crude terms, phonics versus much more of a social cultural perspective of, of literacy. So talking about the middle ground is a very tricky one, right? Because yeah. it's, it's, um, uh, it's couched in histories, it's couched in politics. There's a lot in that kind of a debate, all right? I suppose for me, if I'm gonna look across the panel, I would say a common ground would be an acknowledgement that we need to look seriously at reading. Um, I can't say that focusing on phonics is a common ground and terribly helpful. I think it's a, it's a, it's a piece of a puzzle. It's like baking a cake and focusing on the stirring of the, of the batter, right? Like you need to look at the whole picture of reading. Yes, we have to teach children how to read. Um, yes, we need to have them read books, but we also need to have them read screens. Uh, and then we have years and years and years of training them to understand deeply what different texts are saying and doing. And to me, that's the roll up your sleeves work for literacy educators. Um, so I suppose we'd all acknowledge that teacher education needs to really look seriously at reading. Otherwise, I don't, I don't know the common ground I would find. Um, and I'm just thinking about international research and, and what it's all saying. It, it, it does sound like uh, we're at, at the end of this, we're ending up asking a hell of a lot of our teachers uh, in the classroom and to be sort of operating at this, you know, this multimodal way, as you say, but also at so many different levels. And I, uh, I, my, my shoulders sort of slump a bit thinking at, at what we're requiring them to do and the different levels at which we're asking them to, to kind of meet these students' needs. And, and maybe that's just the way that goes, but I, I feel like I should acknowledge that there. And maybe we can get to a bit of that when the question's coming from the audience. Um, Joe, talk to us a little bit about the science of literacy. Maybe I'll avoid that word, um, but uh, literacy with connection to Indigenous communities. Well, it's, a, um, it's an area where the questions that we were raising at the beginning about context become very, very important. Well, they're important in everything, but they're deeply important here because we're talking about uh, whether or not our education system is going to continue um, in the way it has for such a long time to actively work against the maintenance of the unique languages and traditions of meaning making of First Nations peoples in Australia, and uh, this will be true in Canada and many other countries. In fact, in some assessments, both Australia and Canada are described as the two graveyards of languages in, in the world where the largest number of languages are endangered. Now, it's here where we see that there are deep, in, deeply important questions about context, about human rights, about effective learning and participation in education that aren't about fitting children into pre-existing structures, but about transforming those structures and how they operate really quite radically. And uh, in 1967, um, a delegate from the Queensland Education Department at a conference in Melbourne, and of course, 1967 is a symbolically very important year in Aboriginal rights history in Australia. Um, this person, Kath Walker, later called Ujuru Nunakul, a very important Australian poet, um, she argued for what 
um, our society has simply not been able to do properly since. She argued for deep both ways education, that it's critical that learning and teaching be transformed in a way that actually acknowledges how traditional cultures operate, the contexts in which uh, language is used. And uh, last year, the National Indigenous Languages Report tried to classify the sociocultural contexts uh, of communication in Australian uh, remote communities. And they came up with three very broad categorizations. Um, one in which uh, traditional languages or heritage languages are still actively spoken. Children are taught only in standard Australian English at school. Um, and of course, it depends on the efforts and training of teachers to bridge these two things. So literacy here, is only understood as English literacy and it's only understood as standard Australian English literacy, ignoring all the language and the phonological um, uh, um, processes and knowledge that the children have, their meaning making experiences, all of the ways in which they are already literate in many ways. Um, this is one context. Another context is one in which there are few uh, of these languages, traditional languages, but new languages, um, meaning Creole, K-R-I-O-L, Creole, uh, which is the main language spoken and children are still taught um, um, standard Australian English only in the school. And then there are bilingual contexts in which, like the one at Yirkala, which last year um, showed incredible success rates uh, on the basis of a deep implementation of both ways teaching, really seriously taking into consideration um, Indigenous children's languages, meaning making systems, their relationships within their, their, their groups, their relationships to country and the stories that uh, and ways of telling stories that are uh, um, have been used in East Arnhem Land and, and, and related areas. We know from this particular success that, and there are actually quite a few like this, that the original insight of people like Kath Walker for deep both ways transformational teaching, uh, including around literacy and including, if we want to drill right down the teaching of reading, um, was a very insightful and far-sighted. and our systems have failed to deliver for so long. It's only been when Aboriginal people, First Nations people have managed to grab control of uh, schooling and insist on a curriculum that isn't alienating for their children, yeah. that these kinds of successes have been realised. So, Joe, is it just just briefly, is that what you just described there, is that actually, going back to a previous question, an example of, of, of common ground again um, and where, you know, non-Indigenous Australian reading and uh, practice and teaching practice could actually learn something? Yes, indeed. I think it should be a, a point of common ground, but unfortunately there's resistance in many education ministries for this, despite the fact that the ministers last year actually, or uh, the year before, I can't remember, the Alice Springs Agreement, um, Mpartne Agreement, uh, endorsed this understanding. But uh, if you look at the history of policy in this area, it's one of chopping and changing, of... Um, uh, um, inconsistency of application of then imposing English reading based tests, uh, which are high stakes tests on top of processes that might be enriching of children's learning. And we've just not put all the elements together. And I think it's really because we haven't had a rights perspective and a linguistic human rights perspective. And we do need to do this. I think it's a project for Australia's uh, really important reconciliation development over the next five years, 10 years to get in tune with this much, much more. We've got a question on that, actually, that uh, that uh, our participants can vote on uh, that will take us to that issue during our discussion session. So I'll urge you all to have a look at that. But, Graham, I'll come to you and, and ask and kick off a discussion here if I can. And it's something I think that um, Jennifer's work clearly works in. And I'll come to you as well, Jennifer, about how social spa spaces in and beyond school um, then mediate our experiences of learning to read. Thanks, Virginia. Yes, it, it seems that the notion of a, a social uh, experience of reading is counterintuitive. Uh, people often construct a sense of a very solitary, singular act of somebody sitting in a comfortable chair, uh, reading a novel or the newspaper or even their, their a text on their phone. But in fact, um, getting back to my... I'm going to jump in there and go, 
do they really? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think that's, um, I think it's such an old fashioned view as to be a rather convenient argument. It's just not, it's just not anyone's experience from the age of, you know, two up to, I'd even argue 45 now. It's people crowded around the same screen. It's people sharing a video game. It's yeah. people sending text messages. It's, it's emails. It's, um, not to undercut you completely, but I don't buy that, Graham. In, well, indeed, and 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 I and I would argue that those sort of experiences for people who acknowledge them are actually um, absolutely in tune with the way that we understand the social nature of language. Language is not something which uh, is uh, can can be represented in a, in a dictionary. Um, it's it's something which is alive, can dynamic, continually emerging, con continually uh, um, continually changing, and so. What happens in classrooms, in schools, as institutions, as indeed in communities, is that students are engaged in the very social nature of language. Reading, writing, listening and speaking and viewing is very much a social dimension. Uh, so, for instance, if, if uh, and by their actually being involved in their, their classroom, um, this is something which is not a passive act. It, it should be very much an active act where they're contributing to the collective meaning making. So how, how does this happen? Well, if students are reading a text um, that might be about something deeply traumatic in terms of experience of a refugee traveling on a leaky boat to Australia, um, English teachers will be looking for ways that their diverse students in that classroom can, can both draw on their own experiences and their own understandings of, that, of, of the world um, and their lives um, and the emerging understandings of the text to actually socially develop a sense of understanding. Uh, and then it's, as I've said before, it's not just a matter of developing the skills of reading and writing. It's actually about um, developing identities and understandings, um, uh, ones that are res respectful of, as uh, Joe was saying, that the cultures and the histories from which they're coming. So um, those kind of social classrooms are not just about sharing information. It's about a social, um, a genuinely authentic social space for students to be developing, uh, for their well-being to be uh, sensitively recognized and sort of um, nurtured as they're moving along. So um, th they're the kinds of things I would, I would, um, uh, I'm very happy if more people recognize that um, reading is not a solitary act. Um, um, and, and I think that's really useful in terms of the conversations about reading. Can I get you to jump in there as well, Jennifer? Yeah, uh, I think it's a good question. Um, and I think it's, it, it, when I think about it, I think of macro, mezzo, micro. Macro are some of the issues that Joe talked about, um, and to a certain extent, Shelley, which is um, culture, language, um, social class, uh, uh, regionality. I'm in the UK, I'm a Canadian in the UK, right? So all of those factors play a role in terms of social spaces and how we mediate them, how we navigate them, how we read something, okay? Then the mezzo piece might be national. So in the UK, there are different sets of issues than there are in Australia. Um, and uh, we're wrestling with those here, Canada similarly. So um, when, I, when I was a Canada research chair, it was, uh, there was a real focus on indigeneity, right? And I know Shelley does research on that. Still is, it's a huge issue, right? Um, but then I think when I think about your question, I think about the micro things. So sure there's schooling, right? Graham listed the classic strands of literacy, speaking, listening, reading, writing, viewing. Um, I'm probably missing visualizing. They've added on some strands in the 21st century, okay? So, so and, and there's so many teachers that do an amazing job juggling those skills and speaking to the skills of, of children. But the truth is that reading is huge. It doesn't just happen in the confines of schooling. Reading happens from the moment you wake up. You could even say dreaming is, is a form of reading if you really go out there. But the moment we wake up, we're involved in a series of literacy practices. And those literacy practices need to play a role in the ways in which we teach, okay? Um, and so the social spaces would be Facebook, the social spaces would be Instagram, it would be TikTok, it would be Twitter, it would be Zoom, right? I spent hours on Zoom. It would be the constellation of skills that we use on screens and on print. And so that's why I say that, you know, the social spaces of literacy are, 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 are the virtual, and the, and the representation are visible, but they're also the things that are not visible, right? Um, and the ways in which good gamers, video gamers are very skilled and know vocabulary when they need to play certain kinds of games, 
but then they can't read at school. And so tell me that you can marry these two pictures, um, that, that somebody who's, who's driven and motivated to learn the vocabulary of a first person shooter game, but then in school can't read a basal reader. So I suppose I, I, I put that as a challenge in terms of now I've gone off a little bit, but those are the, the, the sheer diversity of, of the social spaces uh, and domains of, of reading. Jennifer, can you venture an answer to that challenge? Well, I mean, my answer would be um, what I've spent a lot of my career doing, which is to talk to people outside of education. So we've got good teachers. We know about pedagogy. We know about effective teaching. But do we know about design? Do we know about redesign? Do we know about available design? Graphic designers know this. Um, people who do moving image, people who are computer designers know this. Illustrators like our lovely illustrator here knows how to to, to visual communication. So I suppose my big argument is doing cross-sector work within literacy as a field. will start to really enrich the kind of curriculum we develop internationally. Uh, that like, the Nordic, like the Nordic countries, like do we don't, yeah. not always look to the Nordic That's what they do. Yeah, there's a game we play here in Australia, which is um, the, the first person in a discussion to mention the Nordic countries is the best example of anything loses. So Jennifer, <laughs> you're out. Um, but, you know, <laughs> no, no, please don't turn off your video. <laughs> um, but yes, they are always held up as such a high standard. That leads us though into teacher education and uh, specifically uh, uh, literacy teacher education and what might need to change in order to meet digital demands of today's and future students. Um, Jennifer, did you want to pick up a little bit there or uh, and then I'll go to Graham after that? Maybe go to someone else. I okay, great. Yeah, <laughs> great. I, I, I thought I, I might mention that the the recently released OECD report that um, I think you, Virginia, mentioned, and also Jennifer, yeah. um, called Twenty First Century Readers. It it, it it includes a very interesting um, contradiction that uh, for for some countries of the world uh, that were um, using digital technologies in the teaching of reading and literacy in classrooms that had a positive effect on the, the, the students' reading and their development. Um, as, uh, but for others, it actually had a negative effect, which is very interesting. I, I think one of the countries that it was positively correlated was Australia, and, and, and we should be thankful of uh, the teacher educators that are actually helping um, the uh, teachers who are going out into the profession to think about um, how, when, why, and what kinds of res um, digital resources they might be using in, in classrooms to, uh, to, help, to help students to develop their reading and literacy practices. Uh, so that's great, you know, um, well done to literacy teacher education, I suppose. The other thing that the, um, the OECD report emphasizes is that young people schools, in schools um, and in their communities um, uh, need to be able to develop their critical and creative dimensions of their literacy. You know, that's really what Jennifer's talking about, is it? Um, drawing on their dreaming as much as um, anything that they might be doing in a classroom. And, and I think it's probably important that um, teacher education continues to do that. Uh, it, it does it at times, but it's constrained by a set of regulatory um, purposes and structures, um, which Jenna alluded to at the very beginning of the conversation, um, where there's kind of a, a sort of a descending into a competition for, for institutions to be more compliant with the, um, with the, the, the regulations that set down by government in terms of um, standardizing literacy teacher um, education curriculum and assessment and, and assessment. And that's really quite disturbing. But um, uh, certainly the, the emphasis on um, a more um, flexible and um, strategic ways of, of finding critical and creative ways to to work with a whole range of reading experiences is something that teacher education at its best is doing and needs to be continue, you know, encouraged to be able to do that. Um, I, I think um, just if I can mention in terms of the Australian context, uh, and this is something which was maybe alluded to by Joe, the, the increasing shift towards a higher and higher emphasis on um, standardized um, testing regimes um, in Australia, the NAPLAN, the um, literacy and numeracy tests in Australia is, is getting way out of control, um, particularly when study after study has shown that NAPLAN is flawed, 
um, its its representation of what literacy is is highly kind of narrow and and, and inadequate, um, and and the, and the, the 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 greatest difficulty with it is that um, we've been investing these vast amounts of money into standardising um, literacy when um, at best at best reading um, um, outcomes or results are flatlining. And, and writing is actually going downhill, even with the narrowness of the, of the tasks that students are doing in NAPLAN test. So one of the things that literature, um, to, that uh, teacher education can be doing, hopefully in the literacy area, is uh, helping students to, to uh, appreciate that there are some kind of flaws with some of these um, seemingly um, highly valued, high stakes um, um, testing procedures. Um, and they can be really quite damaging for the kind of rich way we're thinking about literacy instruction and literacy development and identity development uh, that we've been talking about on this panel. I wonder if there might be some questions on that as well. We've got some great ones coming in, so I may even get to questions a little bit earlier because I know that everyone will have a lot to say on that. But before I do, um, uh, Joe, anything you'd like to add there about teacher education needing to change in what respects? Well, I think it's important to keep in mind that about a, th a third of students in Australian urban schools um, don't go home to um, speak English uh, only, or uh, uh, they're either completely immersed in languages other than English, or English is only one of the languages that they hear at home. And it's usually not the, the main one, and certainly not the dominant one of their parents. And the whole way in which we have to think about literacy and reading and, and any kind of pedagogical uh, practice in a context in which such a large percentage of learners are different from how we imagined they would be when we designed the curriculums that we subject them to these days is a really urgent task that we keep squibbing. There have been lots of side stream efforts to do this over many years of policy and some very innovative and good things. But we, what we have to do is reimagine what the activity of learning, the foundational activity and the access uh, resource that we'll call it literacy for the uh, reading for just uh, the moment, but it is much richer than that. Uh, what this is and what learners um, bring to it and how they mediate uh, what they hear from what they already know. It's a much, it's a teacher education is the place where students can do research based activities around the particularities of different schools to learn general principles of the relationship between languages, forms of writing, forms of representation of speech in many, for, in many modalities, how these interact with each other and make meaning, and how we go beyond them just decoding or extracting information from these things, but becoming active critical users of them. This is actually an urgent task for citizenship, and it's also an urgent task for a new kind of being in the world, because it's not ever going to go back to simple uh, regimes of linking language and literacy. So the task is not going to be done by any site in the society other than teacher education. Shelley, can I get your perspective on that? I'd like to add, thinking about the democratization of, um, of teaching and learning, that perhaps we should think about who is creating the knowledge on which we base our understanding of what reading is and how to teach reading. The research that I've been doing in northern communities in Canada um, suggests that when teachers are involved in collaborative action research, that the knowledge that is created is very grounded, it's contextualized, and the teachers are applying what they're learning to their own professional learning. Um, so it's, it's being applied directly to what they're doing in classrooms. And so I would suggest that teacher education needs to focus more on teachers co-constructing knowledge with each other and with the, the more traditional researchers. Well, let me pick up one of the questions from the audience then, because I think it feeds really nicely into where we are now. Kerry has asked this. How do teachers decide how to teach? Do they not turn to the research, evaluate what has the best evidence, and then apply it with what they know about the student? Is that not the science of reading? Does someone uh, want to jump in there immediately and, and respond to that? Well, I, I just want to say that um, increasingly, uh, the, the professionalism and adaptability of teachers. The, the comments Shelley just made are very important 
in this context, uh, it's being removed from them. Um, uh, they're being uh, um, uh, organized by expectations in intrusive curriculum designs and testing in particular, uh, which are external to the context of teaching to a really large extent. So um, the uh, autonomy or the, the professional ability of teachers to do what is um, uh, suggested in the question is being uh, reduced over time. And I think that's not the way to go. I think it's very important to work. I think we should invest much more as a society in teacher education than we actually do. And I think we should do it in a way that uh, makes teachers or helps teachers to be engaged in research assignments with professional full-time researchers around problems that they will face in real settings uh, of uh, you know the typical kind of uh, learning environment and learner demography that uh, that we have in our schools. Uh, Jennifer or, or Shelley or Janet, did you want to jump in there? Janet? Yeah, I just I just wanted to chime in to say um, the the short answer is yes, Carrie. Um, you do you do want to base teaching partially on research and also just. Some te- you know, many teachers are just highly skilled and they understand their students and they speak to them and care for them and figure out how best to foster reading. So that's kind of a, an easy one. Um, I like Shelley's point about co-construction. I agree. I suppose my only caveat is when you're dealing with communities like the North in Canada uh, and the same situation in Australia, you have to come in being willing to, and I know Chile does this, uh, being willing to um, speak to, to that community and not come in as a white settler, right? So there is, there are very hard, there's a very hard history in Australia, Canada and, and here and other places um, in terms of racism and intolerance and, so I think when you go in and you co-construct, you really create equality and you really say, these are flattened hierarchies. We know something's not working. How can we be respectful and build on knowledge systems together? And that might sound warm and fuzzy or, 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 or difficult, but, it, but there are researchers who do it really well. And there are international contexts that do it really well. New Zealand, for example, um, has a curriculum that's, that's excellent um and it's built on um a respect for different knowledge systems different alphabetic systems um different semiotic systems coming together and saying how can we produce a curriculum that speaks to the learner's needs that's a great observation we we won't be surprised at all to hear that example from new zealand they seem to lead the way in so many respects janet did you want to jump in there too uh, I um, I think um, the richness of the curriculum that the panelists are describing is just so exciting and so um, necessary to sort of you know expand our um, you know expand what teachers do in classrooms. I guess I'd, I'd bring um, graduate teachers and teachers back to some of the research that has been around, and you know I'm you know, something that we can perhaps ground them around in terms of, you know, panel of reading experts who had talked about, you know, some fundamental aspects of reading that are that are key on which we build. So we talked about phonics before. We, know, you know, Joe's talked about linguistic repertoires and um, vocabulary knowledge. You know, some of these things are really central to, um, you know, our early, you know, particularly teaching um, in the early years. And I think for teachers who are moving into schools, you know, knowing that this is actually sort of, you know, foundational practices on which we then build, carefully attending to this, but also I think, you know, as as teachers move into schools, I think thinking about um, and seeking the advice of mentors in mentors in schools, you know, who know their schools, who know the, the children in their schools, who know their classrooms and oh sorry, and their community needs and expectations. So these are actually going to help craft the mix okay. that's you know central to what you know new teachers are doing um, as they move into classrooms. Let's you know, get, really, let, oh, sorry, sorry to cut you off there. We just want to get to a few more uh, questions and we, we might just sort of maybe get one person to answer each so we can move through through more but the question with the most votes at the moment from our participants today is this in terms of the science could any of the panels share their views on the findings from the national reading panel 
and our Australian National Inquiry into the Teaching of Literacy. Um, Jennifer and Shelley, I, I don't know if this uh, can possibly include you, maybe not, but, um, but Janet, Graham, Joe, who'd like to jump in there? Well, I could perhaps just build on, you know, the comments from before that the National Reading Panel of Experts have identified phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, fluency and comprehension as what I was talking about before is those foundational elements on which early reading instruction is perhaps based or built. But, you know, I guess the panellists have said, you know, that's not where it stops. So we do need to think about how we pay close attention to each of those elements. And, you know, and they are, you know, they're included in our curriculum documents. They're included in our, um, in our frameworks for teaching. So in response to this notion of, you know, the national panel um, of reading and their findings, you know, these things are not disputed here. They are foundational to our instructional practices. Uh, just quickly from um, Joe, if you'd like to jump in. No, I, I support Janet's um, point there. Okay. Well, the, the next question is um, from Jennifer B. And it says, the simple view of reading is a simple model of a complex cognitive process. It's been validated in dozens of independent scientific studies involving thousands of students of all ages in multiple languages. Does the panel disagree with that assertion? I guess I'm not sure about the simple model of reading. <laughs> I think that we uh, we would say um, that the way that we're talking about meaning making uh, through the multiplicity or sometimes use the, the constellation of ways in which um, uh, the semiotic symbols that, that, uh, that readers are working with, um, it just belies the, 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 the possibilities of a, of a simple model. Um, if, if anything, it, it actually um, is, is an interesting starting point, um, but, uh, but um, uh, the, the kind of research um, that is, is presented in, in certain journals uh, to support a particular, journal, uh, to particular view of, um, of reading is, of course, valuable, but um, only a part of a, of, a, of a much richer conversation, I would say, in terms of the way that I was defining um, a science as a sort of a, a dynamic combination of of conversations um, which which often um, work at quite different levels. Anyone else like to jump in? Yeah, there? Jennifer? yeah I, was, I was just going to say, um, sure, that's, you know, you could say that, you could say that there are thousands of studies with looking at thousands of students across the United States in large areas of, of different countries, but you could equally find studies that cover large populations on the ground, qualitative studies, close observations of comprehension, close observations of critical awareness, close observations of complex semiotic, linguistic, cultural work that are equally compelling. So it's not really a helpful thing to say there are simple studies. And as far as the National Reading Panel, yes, it, 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 it was very powerful in its day, but do remember that that was 20 years ago. Um, and do remember that these are these models that that, you know, I mean, I know Janet said they're kind of classic models and they are and they still stand to an extent, but they are part of, as Graham says, a larger conversation about reading um, and part of a history of reading, which is long and 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 quite contested. Well, there's a question here that actually feeds into this. Um, there's no name here, but it says, on the whole, do you believe that the rapidly proliferating digital communication devices that young people read read from are improving their reading abilities? I'd like to go there. They're radically different relationships to the text, to the to the texts. Um, they're not reading in the way. Um, that uh, I think maybe might be implied in the question. Uh, they're interacting with texts and and often authoring and and in real time. See, um, in the past, when uh, uh, before the immediacy of digital texts, um, uh, spoken language and written language were radically different from each other because the expectation in writing was that the 
in inverted commas, the consumption of the writing would be displaced in time. You know, uh, when my parents migrated to Australia, they, they, they would get letters which uh, always assumed that they would be read in the opposite season. So, you know, it, the assumption was that the reader of the letter would be reading it six months after the writer had, had sent it. Whereas a text that's produced today is actually a form of speech, a, a lot of them, um, in which the interaction is temporally immediate. And so a lot of what you need to say and structure in a text that's assuming that someone won't read it for a long time, you don't need to do in contemporary text. So the relationship to text today, which are uh, consumed in inverted commas, but um, you know that might not be the best verb to use, but uh, that are received and are used and responded to immediately is completely different from a language only print based text. So I think the answer to the question is the uh, these devices are never going to go away. Um, there's just going to be more of it. The relationship between speech and writing has been completely historically transformed. Uh, you know, the only radical change in the relationship between speech and writing in the last 1,500 years has occurred in the last 10 years. And this incredible change changes everything because the way in which we think of all of the processes has to be reimagined, as I think Jennifer said before. And so that's what I think I would say to this. Um, I, I, I think lamenting um, loss of some skills that were appropriate to dealing just with printed uh, material in the past is not gonna get us very far. In Sydney in 1907, Bishop Lauf was complaining about the standards of reading that young uh, boys at the time were exhibited. It's always going to be that, uh, that's always gonna be present as a way people are going to find something wrong with the way young people uh, deal with language and, uh, and, um, and literacy. Um, but the particular problem that we face is totally unprecedented and we're not helped by being pulled back to considerations that really aren't contemporary anymore. Um, anyone else quickly want to jump in there and then I'll move on to a last question. No? Okay. This question is um, from Pamela. I'm curious to know what the primary school teacher down the road should take away from this discussion, asks Pamela. Shelley, can I start with you? I'd say that if, if the science of reading is, is going to be in a, in something that you're going to encounter as a primary teacher, either through curriculum, through administrators' conversations, through parents' conversations, I'm, I'm hoping that you have um, some, so you have some of your own evidence um, that you can bring to say, you ha we have to think about literacy in a broader way. And um, so we don't have to narrow the way that we think about literacy to just the science of reading, that there are many alternatives, um, any, many different approaches that, that a, a primary teacher can use. And especially when thinking about children who are having difficulties with reading or with any of the other literacies, that um, you don't have to be part of, of uh, a program that's that's explicit, that takes away your sense of professionalism, that there are other alternatives and you have people around the world to support you. Anyone else want to add some advice there to Pamela? Mm. I think hey, Pamela, it's a great question. Um, I'd say um, teach your children the alph alphabet. I would also say um, have some comic books in there. I would also say have some, have create a little maker space. I would also say, um, have them skim and scan the tablet and look through how you navigate across text. So I think the best thing a primary teacher can do is create the dynamism that, that children want, deserve uh, to get in a classroom. And I would say, do not hit them with flashcards of letters <laughs> and, and, and digraphs and trigraphs. Certainly that plays a bit of a role but I think a much more expansive view for a primary teacher would be a would be a lively, exciting uh, classroom. I'll go to I, Janet. I, Janet I'll, I'll go to Janet first, and Joe, if I've got time, I'll come to you. Go on, Janet. Okay. I mean, I think one of the things that uh, all primary school teachers um, 
would think about in terms of teaching reading is, you know, what are the experiences the children have and what experiences do we need to um, make up for those children? So some children come to school with very rich understandings and sort of conceptual understandings of literacy and others don't. So, you know, making up those rich experiences and then interrogating and drilling down into where are the, what's the profile of the different, the children in the classroom? Where are their strengths and where are the areas that need to be developed? And I think we're all, you know, open enough to say that, you know, this is going to be diverse and will de be dependent on what the children knows and brings to the classroom. And, and there's going to be a different mix of children in every classroom in terms of the experiences they bring, what they know about literacy, and what they still need to know about literacy. So really clearly looking at the children, thinking about that profile that they bring to you as a young reader, and where are the gaps and what do you need to do as a teacher to support their learning moving forward? Joe, just very quickly, because I've got a final question I'd love to go to. Yes, I just agree with everything. Everything's been said, but um, maybe I could just add that the, I hope they take away the idea and the feeling that our primary school teachers are among the most important people in our society. And any kind, and I, I, I mean that not rhetorically at all, um, that the uh, prospects of almost any of the citizenship visions that our society gives itself really depend overwhelmingly on our supporting teachers more. Okay. And um, this final question, I think we can just fit it in, is what do the panellists believe is the best way to teach students so they can eventually read to learn, asks Carly. And I guess that's asking everyone to sort of screw their colours to the sticking point, I guess. Graham? But can I say to Carly respectfully, um, I'm not sure that we have to wait to students get to the moment where they are ready to read to learn and that um, the, mm -hmm. the earliest experiences of engaging with texts and sounds and, um, and images, um, they are in a sense, both uh, learning to read and reading to learn. Mm -hmm. Some of the play in the earliest experiences, preschool and outside of school and in school involves a combination of learning to read and reading to learn and that uh, we shouldn't be concerned about a sort of a, a predetermined time frame which says up to this moment of time the concentration should be on um, learning to read and after that time we are afforded the luxury of being able to um, read to learn. Anyone else like to just make a final comment there? No? Well then I think um, uh, we're giving the final word to Graham and uh, a wonderful a really terrific conversation, a great series of questions from a highly engaged audience today as well. So um, I'd like to thank everyone for contributing and for being here today and where you are. Jennifer Rousel, Joseph Lobianco, Janet Skull, Graham Parr, and uh, Shelley Stagg-Peterson, thank you to all of you. And thanks everyone for coming along and for joining us and for being here and taking part in this discussion.